Good morning. How are you all this morning? Is there an F over there? Oh, okay. Well, I'm doing wonderful. Well, I'm doing very wonderful. It's a good day, isn't it, to be in the house of the Lord? It's a good afternoon. Again, uh, it seems like I always end up preaching on the day that the Bears play the Packers. It's very, very exciting. I don't know why they always keep losing on those same days. I'm, that's been going on for quite a while. I don't know. I'm not sure what that's about, but we're going to give it a go anyway and see if we can't change uh, what's going on. We're going to look at uh, <laughs> Genesis uh, chapter 3 this morning. Um, just real quick, we're continuing our series about the prophecies of Jesus, uh, the Messiah coming. And um, it's been, I hope you've been encouraged looking through these uh, prophecies and looking through these promises. Uh, for me, uh, this season is about promises. Advent, it's about promises. You know, the excitement, hopefully as Christians, it's the excitement of Jesus. It's the excitement of, of what he did and remembering that and getting the chance to celebrate it. Often, though, we kind of water it down and we get excited about the promise of time off, right? Or promise of family time, the promise of <coughs> gifts, the promise of whatever it might be. But it, the thing is, it's, it's a time that builds excitement. That's how, I, that's how I feel. Every time we begin to set up the trees and, and set up the decorations outside and climb the ladder and put the lights on the roof and try not to fall off, right? It's excitement that begins to just dwell inside of our hearts, inside of our minds, and, and we just get excited. I think that's part of the reason why Christmas keeps happening earlier and earlier, you know, like before Thanksgiving or, you know, before Fourth of July or whenever you begin to celebrate. It's just this the excitement and this anticipation. But for us as Christians, we need to make sure that that excitement and anticipation is focused on the promise of what God has done for us, not just the excitement of time off and peppermint milkshakes from Chick-fil-A and yes and family gifts and sleeping in and stockings but that excitement this morning I want to talk to you a little bit about where that actually should begin and this morning we want to look just at Genesis chapter 3 one of the most pivotal points in all of human history and maybe not for the reason that you might be thinking if you, if you know um, your word and you know uh, this section of the Bible, you know that this is the, the place where everything that God created began to fall apart. This is where Adam and Eve stepped out of the plan God had for them and decided they knew what was best. They believed the lie that the, the devil told them, and, and they stepped into that. We're going to read that this morning real quick. We're actually going to read all, almost all of chapter 3. Chapter 3 begins this way. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but, not, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman, woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together, and they made coverings for themselves. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. It's always important to have somebody to blame. Always important to have somebody to blame. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is it that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me. See, got to have somebody to blame. And I ate it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her offspring and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and he will and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. 
Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. That, you, that I commanded you must not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you eat all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since it from where you were taken, and dust you will return. One of the most pivotal stories, not, not just a story, but most pivotal times in the history of the world. This is when everything, like I said, has fallen apart. But that's not the pivotal moment in the story. This is what we often like to do. We like to make ourselves the point of the story, right? Even in our downfall, we like to make ourselves the point of the story. So in here, we tend to focus on the sin that Adam and Eve committed. You know, they had one job, one rule, one rule to follow, and they couldn't. And they sinned against the Lord. But that is not the pivotal moment in the story. And I don't know how many times you've read it, and I don't know how many times you really have dug into it, but we're going to take just a few minutes and dig into it. The pivotal part of the story is what happens next. See, this is the first time in all of humanity that sin has happened. Now, for us, sin is old hat, right? We understand how it works. We mess up. God forgives us. We mess up. God forgives us. We mess up. God forgives us. But here, this is the first time. There's no precedent. There's no this is how it works. There is nothing to base this off of. And so I wonder, you know, what is going through? Obviously, Adam and Eve have no idea what's going through, so, so their first idea, and we still do this today, is we hide. We hide from the Lord because we are ashamed. We hide from the Lord because maybe we're afraid. And we don't remember, you know, now what God actually does. But if you look at this story, this is where God sets the precedent for how sin is dealt with. His first reaction to the very first sin of the world was not, hey, uh, by the way, you sinned, you messed up, I'm going to kick you out of the garden. That did happen, right? His first reaction wasn't, hey, uh, dude, you sinned, so now you're going to have to work this earth. Here's the result of your sin. You're going to have to work this earth. Yeah? That happened, but it wasn't what happened first. It wasn't that, hey, uh, woman, sorry, childbearing going to be a little difficult. That was one of the results, but it wasn't the response. It wasn't the first response God gave. The first response God gave to sin was the plan of redemption. The first response was grace. His first step toward Adam and Eve was redemption. Let's look at it again. He says, Cursed are you, talking to the serpent, above all livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat the dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. And here it is. Her offspring, her seed, will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Right there in the midst of the very first time that anybody in the entire world sinned against God, his first step towards them was, I'm going to tell you how I'm going to redeem you. Talk about a promise. When I was looking at this and we started talking about this and the prophecies of of Jesus to come, the immediate thought I always have when we begin to talk about prophecies, especially ones that are coming directly from God, directly written by God, are these are promises. Because promises are something I can relate to a little more than I can prophecies. I don't know about you, but promises are something I can grasp a hold of, I can wrap my head around a lot more. And you talk about a promise. From the beginning of time, from the beginning uh, of man, when sin entered the world, the promise has always been and will always be, I am going to redeem you. Right here, the first act is grace. The first act is is redemption. Were there consequences to their sin? Absolutely. Are there consequences to yours and my sin? Absolutely. But God's first step, and his first step will always be, it was then, it will be now, is to redeem you. Here, he promised it saying, the seed of the woman will crush the seed of the devil. 
and he put this plan into place. It's interesting, when I begin to think about promises, and this is the first big promise, right? When I think about promises, you know, there's a couple things that, that enter my mind. One, promises are always something we wait for. When somebody promises you something, it is something that happens later. If I promise you, hey, I'll pay you back, hopefully that means I actually don't have any money in my wallet. I'm not just hiding the money in my wallet, but I'm going to pay you back. Right? If, if you've bought me lunch and I say, hey, I'll pay you back, the promise is I'll pay you back in the future. Right? When we promise our children things, it is not the promise of here in two seconds I'm going to do this. It's always a promise of, hey, yes, we'll go do this, or I'm going to do this for you, or you know, we're going to go to this place. We promise people things all the time. And promises are something we wait for. There's always something that we anticipate. There's always something that <coughs> hopefully we're getting excited about because usually always promises are good things. Every now and then we promise a few things that aren't so good, right? Do you ever promise some, a few things to your children that aren't so good? Yeah? Okay. Just checking. <laughs> and those promises for those kids are very anxious times as well right? But when we're celebrating Advent, we're celebrating the promise of the coming Messiah. That excitement should build, because in one instance, we're celebrating what Jesus has already done, that he has already come, and so it's a promise that's already been fulfilled. But as Christians, we're also celebrating the promise of Jesus to come again. And hopefully what we, we can grasp is that all the other promises that he has given us, that he has follow through on. Billy was talking about it last week, that number of prophecies, the number of promises that Jesus Messiah had, has fulfilled for us. Your problem is we relate, prof we relate promises and, and, and prophecies in our own human understanding sometimes. Because another thing about promises in the human understanding, in our culture, in our, in our relationships with other people, is they're not always fulfilled. All of us in the room have had a promise that, that's been given to us, that's been told to us, that hasn't been fulfilled. All of us in the room have probably given a promise to somebody that we haven't fulfilled. And so sometimes in our human understanding, there's that, ooh, yeah, I promise. I don't know. I, I don't know how that works necessarily. I don't, I, I don't know if I believe that. For some of you, that might be your immediate reaction to a promise. Because maybe in your life, somebody has broken promises over and over and over again. And so the excitement is not there for you when you hear the word promise. Maybe it's anxiety or maybe it's fear or sheer terror that, nope, I know that's never going to happen. And actually what's going to happen is disappointment and hurt. The thing we have to remind ourselves when we're dealing with the promises of God is that they are promises of God. They are not promises of man. Promises of man don't always become fulfilled. But the promises of God do every time. So here he, he promises redemption to us. In Matthew, we see it come to, to fruition when, when, when they're talking about Jesus coming. And you know, John the Baptist is the foreteller in this time. It says he's going to come to free us from our sins. He's coming to free us from our sins. It's in Matthew Chapter 1, verse 20, verse 22, if you read it, it says he's coming to free you from your sin. That's the promise that we see here in 315 is that he is going to come and he is going to crush the head of the serpent. Now, the serpent bruises his heel. See, these are the promises of God. But we still always refer to promises kind of in our human mentality. At least I do. I don't want to speak for everybody here. But I still tend to hold on to no matter how many times I read the scriptures and how many times I tell myself all the promises of God are. Yes and amen. You know, often we take Scripture out of context, right? And uh, we don't give it its full meaning. And a lot of times that's a, a negative thing. You know, a lot of people quote this verse, all God's promises are yes and amen. You know where it's found? I'm sorry, I won't put you on the spot. It's found in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. I just want to encourage you not to take this Scripture out of context because there is a lot more to this passage of Scripture than all God's promises are yes and amen. There's a lot more power as you read this. If you go back, 2 Corinthians, if you want to turn there, hopefully you already have. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 
starting in verse 19. It says, but surely, this is Paul, but surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. It has always been yes. God has made, for, uh, so sorry, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. No matter how many, they have always been yes and always will continue to be yes. Don't quote just the scripture, all God's promises are yes and amen. It almost sounds like there's not you know, much to it and we're just kind of tossing that out there as kind of a, oh, all God's promises are yes and amen. No, no, it says everything he said is yes and it will always be yes. And no matter how many promises he makes, they will always be yes. You know, people that fall through on promises often make more promises. That's how they recover some strange way from false promises. Hey, I promise I'll do this for you. And then they fall through. Okay, listen, I'm sorry I fell through, but I promise I will. And they fall through and it says, I promise I will. But with God, he follows through on every single promise and then continues to give more. And it says no matter how many promises he gives, they will always be yes. You know, that first promise is that he will always move towards us with redemption and restoration, with healing, with wanting to draw us back. You know, as we celebrate Advent, as we, as we move into the season of, of remembering what Jesus did for us and what he has promised to do, we need to hold on to it so that God has made the promise. Often we equate waiting with no. Waiting is hard. Anybody find waiting easy? Anybody in the room good at waiting? I'd like to think I'm terribly bad at waiting. But waiting is not no. Waiting is waiting. Waiting is the time where God begins to work on us, begins to move in our hearts and begins to mold and begins to shape and begins to prepare us and, and to show us things as he then begins to fulfill the promise. You know, not to jump around in seasons, but one of my favorite things about Palm Sunday, which if you're new to the Lutheran Church and a whole bunch of different seasons, I don't want to confuse you. So if I try to start explaining it, it'll get even more confusing. But Palm Sunday, what, one of the most incredible things about Palm Sunday to me is, is not that Jesus came just riding on a donkey and then people were laying down their palms and everybody was celebrating he came into Jerusalem. That's not the most exciting thing for me. The most exciting thing for me is he did it as he said he was going to do it. He didn't ride on a donkey because it was hip and it was cool and the donkey is one of the coolest animals that there might be in the world. No, no, he did it because that's what he said he was going to do. He came riding into Jerusalem because that's what he said he was going to do. God sent his son here on this earth to save us from our sins because that's what he said he was going to do. So what are the things that you're waiting on? Because according to the Bible that I read, if he said he's going to do it, he's going to do it. And so this morning, what I really want to do is encourage you that, as Pastor Billy was saying last week, if you look at all the prophecies and all the promises that he fulfilled, that should encourage you and, and, and remind you each and every day that the things he spoke to you, the things he has been saying to you, the things from the beginning of time will come to pass. Because that's what he does. All his promises are yes. No matter how many he makes, they are always yes. You know, here in chapter 3, verse 15, it's the promise of redemption. But I just want to remind us as, as I close <clears throat> of what that really looks like. And in the promise, it, it, is, it is told to us what it's going to look like. It says that the seed will crush the serpent, but it also says, and don't forget, that the serpent will bruise Jesus. It says that the serpent will bruise your offspring. You know, Jesus, we celebrate him coming, but he came so that he could sacrifice for 
the things that happened, for the sin in our life, for the sin in Adam and Eve's life, for the sin in every single person's life. It has to be a price. It has to be paid. There's a consequence. You know, we, when we think we always have a consequence to our sin, and it's true, there are things that happen because of our sin, but not the ultimate consequence. The ultimate consequence of death was paid for by Jesus, foretold right here in the beginning of history. That I'm going to redeem you, and here's what it's going to take. And as I, as I read that passage in Matthew where it says, He came to free us from our sins. You know, it's such a nice statement, I am free. Often I forget when I, when I read those kinds of things, the price that was paid. The ultimate price that was paid, that Jesus came into this world, and I can imagine the excitement as those promises were fulfilled, and the promises were fulfilled, and, and Jesus was born, and promises kept being fulfilled. Did people start looking at the promises that were foretold about him dying on the cross? It's something that, that I th- try to think about as often as I can to remember what God said he would do for us, to remember what God did for you and for me. We're, we're going to celebrate it here in just a few minutes. That from the beginning of time, when sin first entered, his plan was redemption by the cross. That something had to happen. Somebody had to pay. And God said, I will pay. What an incredible promise. So I just want to encourage you this morning that from the beginning of time, God has always moved towards us by redemption, by restoration, by healing, by willing to pay for your sins so that you may have eternal life, so that I may have eternal life. So as we celebrate this Advent season, as we celebrate Christmas, get excited about the promises God has given you. Get excited about the promise that that Jesus will come again and that one day we will all sit with him in eternity. Like Reggie said, one day there, there won't be a choice. Now there is a choice. I want to encourage you this, this week, this, we only have a couple more weeks of the Advent season, to hold on to the promises of God, to the prophecies of God, to what he said he was going to do. Because every single one, no matter how many he gives us, will all be yes, will all be amen. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that everything that you have promised is yes. That there is no shortcomings, there are no fall-throughs, only fulfillment. Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember those things you promised us, that we would hold tight, Lord, as we wait, as we anticipate the fulfillment of the promises. Lord, I pray that you would encourage, you would uplift each and every one here as they walk through that time. Lord, I pray that you would renew people's hearts and minds what it, a promise looks like from you. That we wouldn't hold fast to the way that humans have promised and fallen through, but we would hold fast to the way that you, God Almighty, King of the universe, have promised and followed through every single time. Lord, that we'd have peace while we wait. That we have patience, Lord, that we be full of hope. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.